I was coincidentally watching the ASP.NET community stand up when they go to, to .NET RC2 and explain the changes in Blazor. Uh, while my pipelines broke and while push, publishing to Azure and I didn't really change anything so yeah so I upgraded to RC2 you can find the documentation if you just google .NET 8 RC2 and all the new things are explained in here RC2 is supposed to be the last release candidate so after this one I assume it's going to be the official .NET 8 so the first thing you do of course is install the RC2 SDK and you might have to restart and then you can do .NET list SDKs and double check if the RC2 is there, the SDK. And let's apply these changes to our brand website project. We'll start with Blazor and then we'll go over to the identity endpoints. So the email sending specifically. So the first thing would be they renamed something so the render mode server WebAssembly auto they renamed it to tell you that these are the interactive render modes so interactive server interactive WebAssembly interactive auto interactive just means that if you click that counter button on the demo project that actually the count goes up thanks to the web sockets or thanks to the blazer WebAssembly if you wouldn't use any of these render modes, then you're assumed to be statically rendering. If you click any button, the counter button specifically, then nothing would happen because you're not using any interactivity. So then they talk about the global interactivity for Blazor web apps. They kind of uh, give an example of each of the web app templates. So you've got yeah, interactivity type, so that's the non, is that static rendering without any interactivity. Then you have server interactivity, WebAssembly interactivity, or auto, which is also interactive. So the renaming would look more like this uh, at render mode, interactive auto, or interactive WebAssembly, or interactive server. And in the video, they also mentioned that that render mode dot will also go away. And then you can just specify interactive auto, interactive WebAssembly of, or interactive server instead of the whole thing. What's important about this Blazor web apps templates, that is not the Blazor WebAssembly template. And that is also not the Blazor server template. This is actually a template that will contain, mostly contain two projects out of the box, a server compo uh, project and a client project. Unless, of course, you only choose the server, if I'm not mistaken. If you choose WebAssembly, you're going to get a server project and a client project. If you choose Auto, you're, you're going to get also that server project and that client project and pre-rendering will be enabled by default. So let's take a look at these templates. I don't have Visual Studio installed, I think. If I say .NET new list. Then you see the Blazor server app. So that's just only the Blazor server project with the web sockets and with that weather forecasts page and counter then you have the blazer server empty which shouldn't contain those example components like the counter and the weather forecast then you have that blazer web app so that's what's displayed here with the interactivity types that's the special one so just blazer template and then below you have Blazor WebAssembly so that's gonna be only the client project and then what they also mentioned is you can kind of specify your own render mode if you want interactive WebAssembly render mode but you don't want pre-rendering for example then you can fine-tune that and use this custom render mode at the top 
using the add render mode. So no longer these attributes, they're gonna be removed in the .NET 8 official version and we're gonna have to use it like add render mode interactive server if you choose to uh, specify the interactivity type on a component individually. If you're not gonna do that, I don't think you have to bother with all of these things. And this is actually also really cool, the identity UI for Blazor. So if you use this, yeah, if you specify dash o individual, so authentication individual, you're also going to get these Blazor pages. So this Blazor template, that's the web app template that we just saw in the terminal. And then you also get these pages, login registered and then a protected page, forgot your password, register as new user, recent confirmation email. And it has validation inside and all of that. But note, register in account, it's email, password, password. So. I don't think you can really customize it to have the user's name or language or address or whatever. That's not yet supported. And they did say something about some known issues, something with the... If you generate that web app template from Blazor with the server on the client project, for some reason the error.razor page ended up in the client project and the server project can't find it. So then you simply move that over to the server project components folder. So I went to my brand implementation project. I started with the single page application, the WebAssembly client, since that one was complaining in the host.razor. I had to apply that renaming of WebAssembly to Interactive WebAssembly. So a few lines I had to change here and the pre-render server programs, yes, so the server side project. And I had to add that use anti-forgery middleware. And then I changed this from add WebAssembly render mode to add Interactive WebAssembly mo render mode. And the same for at the top, add interactive WebAssembly components instead of the WebAssembly components. Yep. Of course, don't forget to upgrade all of your NuGet packages before you can apply these changes. So I do that with this useful tool, upgrade packages in solution. I did that already, of course. And then let's go to the authentication. I was already trying these things out. So if we go to the extensions where we register, instead of using the email sender interface from the identity UI services package, we use it from just from ASP.NET Core um, dot identity so that the, the interface moved and we can specify the type of the user. So yeah, pass along that user, which is just our custom user model inheriting from identity user. And that makes possible that we can address the user by name or use some other user information in these emails that we're sending. So the same here, you're inheriting from email sender you with that uh, user type passed and you use the email sender interface from the ASP.NET Core identity, not the from the UI.services. And then if we take a look at the email sender, then we'll see instead of one method, we now get three methods and we get that user info as the first parameter. So we can access the name or the username at least. Um, then we just get the email and the confirmation link. So they removed the subject and they altered that HTML message. 
since yeah chances are you are going to change that subject anyway translate it in your native language or just change it to something else so that was good as an example but not really useful i think but then so we have got three confirmation link so we're getting this link i assume that's still gonna go to the back end i at least the bug is going to be fixed but we'll probably have to extract the yeah useful information out then we have the send password reset link and i think either this one is for the reset password endpoint and the other one is probably going to be for the forgot password endpoint so we'll have to see which is which so this send email async is the the old one i'll remove it in a, in a bit but we got that email subject and html message which we then had to extract the info from the html message and patch that url to go to our yeah first fix it and make it go to our front end so now we're getting these three new methods I went ahead and pasted the same code in there and I altered the warning messages could not send confirmation could not send password reset mail could not send password reset mail yeah with code or whatever so I did make an API proposal for these as well because currently so I'm already using these um, that was the previous proposal from someone else that got accepted. That's kind of what you see, what you just saw. But my proposal is to also add an optional callback URL because to make that li those links go to the front end. But I might also have multiple applications, multiple web apps. I'm going to need to specify for each web app individually, it's going to be really awkward if uh, they go to the wrong front end. So I hope they at least take a look at it, but I'm not counting on it. And yeah, I asked them, so what I just said, I kind of asked them to just pass the parameters separately so we can make our own links instead of them trying to form these backend links for us. So that's the usage example, frontend confirmation link. Then I can choose, first I can choose to make it go to my frontend and then I can also yeah, to which frontend as well. And I could choose to use route parameters instead of the query per string parameters since Blazor frontends don't like that. And then I merge that reset link and reset go to method into one. Yep. Anyway, I'm not getting my hopes up. I might do a video on JWT authentication again if this does not evolve. And if there is the need, of course, for multiple frontends using that same authentication API. Let's try that and see what we get out of these links. I assume it's just the link to the, yeah, that's going to be my API, which is not really useful. I don't really want uh, people going from their email inbox to my API. Okay, so what we're getting now is indeed that backend endpoint, well, with the user ID as query string parameter and the code. Yeah, I removed the long code. And I just passed along the link. And then that goes to my API. Yeah. I could, but I'm not willing to apply redirection logic to my front end now. Okay, so we can get rid of this previous send email async. This patch bugs I'm gonna keep, but uh, just to form that frontend URL. 
So it should look more like this, but of course now we have separate endpoints for confirmation and reset, so we don't really need to do this check anymore. So I'm going to simplify this code a bit more. All we'll still need to do is yeah, replace those those query string parameters with uh, yeah, reformatted to the frontend URL format, which is going to be more like slash email slash code or something. No, right, they just give you the reset code. So they expect the user to go to the email copy the code over somewhere in the field, likely in the front end. So I hope they take a look at my API proposal to have that callback URL. Okay, so this is the result. I'm getting a nice link. Of course, we'll want a better message, but that's not the thingy. Okay, that looks pretty good. One down, two to go. Account confirmation also works. Then just the reset password link to test. So reset password is what is where you end up after getting that email for forgot password, if I'm not mistaken. And I'm handling that in the front end form. So then from the front end form, I'm just posting to this endpoint with the the email reset code coming from the email and then the new password thanks to the form submit um, but how do we trigger this reset link i have no idea the docs don't say much so that's the form I was talking about. I can say test one, three, four, five. Oops, one, two. You can press reset, and then that should post to reset password endpoint. Okay, I'm going to leave it at that for now. I uh, just added a comment. Send password reset link async. Uh, yeah, not to my knowledge, it never gets hit. Confirmation link does, and I updated this uh, patch bug code. So now that should be good. And the else statement, yeah, should cover this reset link, but yeah, can't really test it. And set password reset code works as well. Should of course have a bit better message. Don't forget to leave a like and subscribe if you haven't already. See you in the next one.